Bible talk here this evening. Tonight we're going to consider the topic, what happens when we die. Now to get the evening started, we're just going to begin with a, a word of prayer to God. If you please rise. Great God Almighty, we praise you as the creator of this world and we thank you for the blessings that you give to us each day. We thank you for this time that we have now that we can come together and learn about your word. We can open the pages of the Bible and, and learn from this things that affect us in our lives today. So please God, be, give us wisdom as we, uh, as we listen tonight, as we consider your word, as we try to come to understand the things about this world that you have told us about. So please God be with us tonight. In the name of your son Jesus we pray. Amen. So to get started with the evening, we're going to read from the Word of God, read from the Bible. It's going to be a passage from the book of John in the New Testament, John chapter 11. We're going to read uh, verses 1 to 44. I think Jamin's going to lead us in that reading. Thank you. Reading with your, reading um, with your John, um, chapter 11, John verses chapter 11, 1, verses 44. 1 to 44. Now a certain, now, man, a was certain Ill. man was Ill. Lazarus of Bethany, Lazarus of Bethany the village of Mary, the village of and, Mary her sister Martha. and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed, it was the, Mary Lord's who anointed ointment, the Lord's feet and wiped, his feet, and with wiped her hair, his feet with whose her brother hair, Lazarus whose brother was Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent so the to sisters him, sent to saying, him Lord, saying, he, Lord, whom you love is he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, when he Jesus said, heard it, he this said, illness does this not lead illness to death. does not lead to it death. It will be for the glory of God. So that the Son of Man may be glorified, may be glorified through it. Now, Jesus now, loved Martha, Jesus loved and Martha, her sister, and her sister, and Lazarus. So when he heard, so Lazarus when he heard, Ill, Lazarus he stayed Ill, two days stayed longer in the two place, where he, in the place where he was. Then. After then, this, he said to his disciples, he said to his disciples, disciples let us go to Judea. Let us go to Judea. The disciples said to him, the disciples said Rabbi, to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now se seeking to stone you, and you were going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If, a, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles, because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was meaning taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, has died, and for your sake I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. Now, but let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had, been already, had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near to Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. And Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And anyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. When she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard this, she rose quickly and went to him. 
Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who, had, who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to Jesus, where Jesus was, and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who were coming with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? And they said, Lord, come see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he, have, could not he who had opened the eyes of the blind men also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, moved deeply again, came to the tomb, and it was a grave, a cave, and a stone was laid against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odour, for he has already been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did not I tell you that if you believed in me, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and you that you heard me, you always heard me, but I said this on account of them standing around, that they may believe that you have sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound in linen strips, and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to him, said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Now, we don't consider necessarily the, the death and resurrection there of Lazarus as being typical amongst what happens when we die, but Peter's now going to talk to us on the topic of what happens when we die. Thanks, Peter. Well, thanks, uh, John and... Thanks for that reading as well, um, Jamin. And good evening, everyone, and um, thanks for coming out tonight to, to hear what the Bible has to say about this important topic, what happens when we die. And so I chose uh, that reading um, because I think it tells us some very interesting things about, about how Jesus thinks about death. And um, it's not... It's not a standard way you would think that about death. So, so that really teaches us something uh, quite fundamental. So, and so this really fits into a key Bible narrative that flows from the beginning to the end of the Bible, and that is um, Christ's victory over death. And sin and death are coupled so closely and um, we find this all throughout the Bible. And actually this is a grand narrative of the Bible, how Jesus firstly defeats sin and then now he's currently in the process of defeating death. So there's a whole range of Bible passages that give us little snippets of information about what happens when we die. And uh, you can, I guess, you can get your information from a whole range of sources. You can go to the Buddhas or, um, or uh, the Egyptians or whoever you want to go to. But tonight, I just want to focus on the Bible and see what the Bible says um, and not, not to look at all the, other, all the other beliefs. Because I believe that the Bible is, does tell us the truth and it shows us uh, exactly what will happen when we die. And so I think in this chapter we get a very important key 
which helps us to unlock the rest of the Bible um, and how, how the rest of the Bible talks about death. So, so uh, we'll look at that tonight. And, and Jesus is so good at getting straight to the heart of the matter. Um, just uses a few words and just helps us to understand uh, this subject. So, and, and it's so easy in our daily lives to get caught up in, in the physicalities of death or um, illness and not, not to look past, past that. But, but the divine perspective gives us a broader range and a better perspective. So, so that's what I want to look at tonight. Now, if you're thinking about where to find information on death in the Bible, uh, there's actually five key passages that we as Christadelphians get all our, or most of our understanding about death. So, um, so that's just a bit of a, a break up of, of how these passages talk about death. So uh, a classic one is Ecclesiastes chapter 9. And we'll go have a look at that first. Um, John 11, the one we looked at tonight. In the middle of Romans has a quite extensive um, section where it, it looks at more of the moral aspect of, of death. And 1 Corinthians 15 and Revelation 20 show us exactly the, um, the events that happen after we die. So, so hopefully we'll be able to get to look at each of those and get uh, maybe just a single point which can help us to understand this subject. Now obviously there's more passages in the Bible which talk about death, but really these are the main ones. And um, if you can understand these five passages, you'll really understand almost... Uh, everything uh, you'll be able to put it into a into a structure anyway, w whatever you learn. So, and so uh, a lot of us, um, I'm not sure where everyone fits in uh, in their experience of death. Um, I know for myself, I haven't really had much experience with close family members or friends dying, um, and. Maybe some of you will have had experience with that. Maybe some of you won't. So, but I think uh, at one stage or another, each one of us will uh, have some sort of experience with this. So, uh, just like Martha learnt, it's good to understand th these things before before it happens, so you can have the faith there to to um, to carry through and to have. And to hold on to hope, so so I think it's quite important, even if um, you haven't experienced death uh, of a loved one yet. So and so, as we learnt uh, in our last lecture two weeks ago, um, really Jesus holds the key to to everything we can learn about the subject. Um, just with the resurrection, he he was the first fruits. He was the first one to go through resurrection and what we um, what we learn from him we can apply to a whole range of different things it's the same it's the same for what happens after death now the bible is quite clear about what happens uh, to us after we die and it it actually agrees with medical science um, so clinical death, uh, found in Wikipedia, is characterised by three main things. The heart stops, um, breathing stops, and there is a loss of brain function. So this means that conscious thought ceases. And even though med modern medicine has come a long way, uh, people can be put on life support for an extended period. Um, even with all that, the longest anyone has uh, survived on life support is um, 17 hours and, and recovered. So, and 
So medical science doesn't doesn't teach the existence of an immortal soul, and and the Bible doesn't either. Um, surprisingly enough, uh, although a lot of people do teach that. Uh, let's look at Ecclesiastes nine, which is our first passage tonight. Ecclesiastes 9. <clears throat> now Solomon is talking here about the vanity of life without God. So what is the baseline for us? If we don't uh, know God or uh, know anything about God, um, what, what happens for us? So this is a reading from the ESV, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. And there is, they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Their love and their hate, their envy have already perished, and forever they have no more share in all that is done under the sun. So they... They don't take part anymore. They, they cease to exist, as it says there. Um, and so what, what is the point that Solomon is telling us? <clears throat> it's in verse 10. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with your might. For there is no work or thought or knowledge or wisdom in Sheol, which is the grave, to which you are going. So he's saying use the opportunities you have now and um, because after you die there's no, there, there's no more opportunities. This, this life is where you make your choices. So, so this is what we are to expect after death. It spells it out. Um, we basically cease to exist completely. Um, Psalm 49 is another one. It's not uh, listed there, but uh, you know whether you're rich or poor, um, no matter what status you have in this life, uh, you you all we will we will all end up in the grave. Now there is an exception to this. Um, there is a way we can live on after death, and that is in the mind of God, in the memory of God. So Ecclesiastes, we see, is a key chapter. We all die, we all cease to exist after death. And if we are to continue on in any way, uh, it's only in the mind of God. No one has an immortal soul. So if we go back to our reading tonight, John chapter 11. So we really want to understand what Jesus is talking about. It can be quite... Uh, Unusual language if it's if you're reading this for the first time, um, and it's actually worth understanding because this gives us a divine perspective on death. And really, Jesus is the only person to, to have survived death. Um, so uh, you can imagine he has some insight into this into this topic. So John chapter 11, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, so John chapter 11, um, we'll look at how Jesus talks about Lazarus, Lazarus' death. Uh, verse 4, he says, this illness does not lead to death. Okay, um, uh, but actually, Lazarus died. So that's a bit interesting. Jesus says in verse 11, uh, after saying these things, he said to them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. Uh, and uh, so verse 13, it says that Jesus had spoken of his death. So he said that he had fallen asleep, but he's talking about death. 
and verse 14, Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. So, so this is quite... Uh, it seems like Jesus is continuing to deny that, Jaz- that Lazarus has died. Uh, and then he seems to talk plainly and say, OK, well, he's actually dead. So to hear Jesus is trying to make a point to his disciples. Um, and really, he's showing us the real truth of the matter, the divine truth. And so uh, if, if we can think like Jesus, we can, we can understand uh, the mind of God and how, how God thinks about, about these topics. Now, uh, so this is, this is uh, a divine language uh, that we're trying to understand. And so what Jesus is doing is he's discriminating between different types of death. So, so, uh, and he's making very purposeful language and very specific. So, so he's saying that Lazarus is sleeping. So this is a key. Um, and actually, there's two uh, ways, there's two forms of death. There's two ways of thinking about death. Um, there is those who are asleep in death, which is talking about the saints who have died. So those in Christ who have died. And Lazarus was in that category. And there is another category where people who have died have perished and will not uh, and they have perished forever and so if we concentrate on this idea of sleeping as, as a form of death um, we can see in, first, in John chapter 11 uh, verse 25 Jesus explains this idea a bit more uh, So Jesus is explaining this to Martha. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So so Jesus is here talking about the ultimate end of of these, these people. And so true believers will actually die, but they will live again at the resurrection. And once they live again at the resurrection, they will never die. And, and really the only true and final death is the death of those people who don't believe uh, in, in Jesus, as he says, there, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And so, um, and so this is a theme throughout the whole Bible. Once we've understood this point, we can apply it to lots of tricky passages in the Bible which talk about sleeping. So, uh, so as we see here, Matthew 9, verse 24, he said, uh, this is Jairus' daughter who had died. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, which we will go to uh, later on. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So it's talking about resurrection. And so you can read through those those verses there. So we have these two groups of people who are are separated based on uh, the final outcome, whether they attain immortal life or whether they are are eternally dead. So, and Jesus is very uh, certain to make us understand the difference. Um, And uh, in John chapter 11, verse 33, I I think this is what troubles Jesus so much, is that... um, When Jesus saw her weeping, saw the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. 
And uh, this is just something I believe uh, could be the case, is that he, these people didn't understand this fact. He, they didn't, under, they didn't uh, emotionally understand that Lazarus would live again, and they were sorrowing for him as if they were, he would never rise again. So, and, and that's why Jesus was so troubled, because he, he thought they... Um, he understood that they did not believe in the resurrection, and, and he was so certain uh, that they needed to believe that. Um, back in verse 25, um, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. So his focus, Jesus' focus is on the resurrection. And so we need to have that same focus and not, and not uh, sorrow as other people do when, at the death of a believer. So, so that's just... Uh, and so another interesting point is if you think the opposite way, um, so that's just more uh, verses there um, about uh, asleep talking as in someone who has died in Christ. <coughs> so in the opposite way, we, the Bible also uses a metaphor for death. So, so if we think about the ultimate outcome of these two groups of people, so there's one group that attains to eternal life and there's another group which will, uh, which will attain eternal death. Um, it, some people who are alive are called dead. So, so uh, quite an interesting little uh, sentence here. And Jesus said to him, follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. So it's kind of hard. I've never seen a dead man burying a, another dead man, but obviously that's talking metaphorically that the people who uh, do not follow Christ are, are classed based on their eternal outcome. Um, so, and uh, yeah, you can read through those. And so you can move from death into life. So, uh, so if we look at uh, yeah, Ephesians 2 verse 1 in the middle there, it says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins. So, so our old way of life was directed towards eternal death, but now in our new way of life, we can, we're directed towards eternal life. So... Uh, so you can see there the eternal um, outcome is, is what is the focus there. So that's just an interesting point there. And so let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now this is quite a tricky verse to understand. It's, it's Paul, Paul writing here to the Corinthians. So you have to have these two ideas in mind. So you've got these two groups of people who are classed on their eternal outcomes. So, uh, so in 1 Corinthians, Paul, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the importance of the doctrine of resurrection. It's absolutely essential to uh, our, our belief as Christians. Um, so, so it's a bit tricky to understand the argument here, but Paul is saying, just imagine if there is no resurrection, what what would things be like? So if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. So this group of people who are classed as sleeping in Christ, if there is no resurrection, then you may as well just call them both uh, in the category of dead because... Uh, and this is another um, another proof for, for 
for the fact that there is no immortal soul. Um, both, both groups of people are exactly the same. They have no conscious thought. Uh, there's no immortal soul. And it's only at the resurrection that, that the asleep, the people classes, those asleep in Christ are raised. And that's, that's the difference between the two groups. It, it becomes apparent at resurrection. And so, um, yeah, as I said, the resurrection makes, makes the difference. So how can we be part of that group of people who will be raised um, and who are in Christ? Well, the first step, I guess, is to know about God. And so if you... The Bible talks about knowing... If you know God then God will know you. And so it's kind of like a two-way relationship. And, and you have to respond to the call of the Bible, the message of the Bible. So uh, let's go over what we've learnt so far. So we started in Ecclesiastes 9, and we learnt that at death there is no conscious thought, there's no immortal soul. And then second of, all, second of all, we've learnt that there's these two groups of people who have died. There's those in Christ and there are those who are not in Christ. And their class is truly dead. So, now let's come back to our reading in John chapter 11. And, and there's actually even more we can get from this passage to understand uh, death. So John chapter 11, verse 4. Now Jesus has the eternal, uh, people's eternal uh, welfare in, uh, in mind. That's where his focus is. And so that's why he says in verse 4, when he heard that Lazarus was quite ill, he said this illness does not lead to death. So he knew that Lazarus, he knew Lazarus's eternal end, and, and it was not death. So, uh, and so this is very interesting to, to think about. What, so if, if a deadly illness that killed Lazarus doesn't lead to death, what does lead to death? Well, uh, it's interesting to see because we, there's a lot of verses in the Bible that talk about what leads to death. Um, it's the source of death. Let's turn to Romans chapter 6 and we get uh, a deeper understanding of this, uh, of the, the source of death. Um, and this also helps us to, so we were talking about the two groups of people before, that helps us to understand how you can move from death into, into the group which has uh, life. Uh, and, and also how to be part of the resurrection. So Romans chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So there's these two paths you can take. There's, there's a path of sin, and which leads to death. And there's a path of obedience, which leads to righteousness and life. And so, so we need to look to the source of death. What, what is the source? And... And the cause of death, uh, if we speak broadly speaking, is sin. We learn that from, from the Garden of Eden. Um, so if we look, so, so we're told in quite a few quotes in the Bible uh, that sin is the cause of death. And so... 
uh, so right back in the Garden of Eden, the source of death was sin. Uh, Jesus created a law. He said, you must not eat of this tree. Uh, and Adam and Eve sinned and they ate of the tree and that, that brought about death, instituted by God. So if you want to sort out the problem of death, you need to sort out the problem of sin. That, that is the first priority. And the only person to survive death was Jesus, and he was sinless. Now, I'm not saying we have to be sinless, but, but we need to look to Jesus for, uh, for the solution to death. Um, so sin and death, they're, they're so tightly coupled together. Um, a few pages over in Romans 8, it, it talks about the law of sin and death. It's, it's so closely coupled together in our, in our nature that, that it, it's a law. It's a law of our behaviour. We, um, we sin and we die, and that's, that's the cycle that we're stuck in. And... It's, it's just something that we're born into when we're born. Um, and really, the, the, it's kind of difficult to figure out what, what makes you under one law or the other, but it's about the choices you make. So, so you, can choose, you can choose the path of death or you can choose the path of life. And so death is, is this moral problem that can be solved by what you choose to do right now. So this law of sin and death, um, it's, a, it's like an old way of life. So, so if you're moving from, from this law of sin and death to the, to the law of the spirit of life, this, this is called like the old law that we were under. But, but now we're starting to, to take on this new law, which is a pattern of behaviour, which, uh, which is a new way of, way of life. And it's so interesting to think, because Romans chapter 6 is a common chapter in, that, that's read at baptisms, and, and really baptism is like the point. That if you were to pick a defining moment, uh, when you change from one one law to the other, that, that is the defining moment. But obviously it doesn't mean that we never sin or that we um, are not under this law of sin and death. We're still under that law, but, but now there's a new competing law which, which we can um, use to overcome this old way of life. So really we, we die to this old way of life. Um, it's, it's a death. Um, and really, we, 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 we become new people. And so if you're thinking of eternal, the, the eternal consequences of things, uh, if, if you're looking at death and life, this, uh, this eternal idea starts now. It starts uh, with your behaviour. It starts with, uh, with baptism. So, and so it's a transformation which which uh, can start today. But it is a struggle, and it's, um, Paul talks about this in uh, Romans chapter 7. Um, he's, he says in the next chapter how wretched he feels when he sins, a wretched man that I am. But he, he commits himself to God, who can save us from our sinful bodies. <clears throat> so how do we get eternal life? Well, it's a choice. It's, it's a choice you make. So, and God offers uh, offers us this eternal life. And what we need to do is is to reach out and accept it. We need to follow what the Bible says, and we need to trust in God. And the offer isn't exclusive. It's it's, it's available to everyone, no matter what you've done in the past or who you are. But it's up to you to choose to accept it and. Uh, and this choice uh, involves turning away from an old way of life, turning away from sin, and turning towards God. So here in Romans chapter 6, we've learnt that 
death is primarily a moral problem. Uh, and to survive death, uh, just as Jesus did, we need a moral solution. Something that can deal with this cause of death, which is sin. But Jesus has already dealt with sin. Um, and, and so what we need to do is to look to him and choose a new way of life with him as our focus. And so in this way, we can join the group uh, who is part, uh, heading towards life and can be part of the resurrection. So what, uh, what are the, the events that happen after we die? What's the specific, uh, uh, the specific chronology? Well, we actually told the, in extensive detail, of our future in the Bible. And uh, Jesus gives us a short summary in John chapter 11, verse 23. So let's turn back there. John chapter 11, verse 23. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, sorry, verse 25, whoever believes in me, though he die, he shall live, and everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So believers will die. They will become unconscious uh, and and not take part in the world anymore, but, but at Jesus' second return, they will live again. And when they live, they will never die. So uh, we have this little summary in mind. Uh, we'll turn, actually later, we'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but, but for the moment... Um, you might be wondering, um, sorry, I'm a few slides behind. Um, you might be wondering how this idea of the lake of fire, eternal flames of torment, how that fits in with what I've been saying so far. Well, the classic uh, doctrine of the churches doesn't actually fit in with what the Bible says, and we'll see that. Uh, in the next two passages. So we'll have a look at Revelation chapter 20 where this uh, idea is taken from and taken out of context. And we'll also look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15 uh, which goes hand in hand with Revelation chapter 20. So first of all, let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we've already been there tonight. And this chapter fits in really well with this broad narrative of Christ uh, overcoming sit, uh, death and sin throughout the whole Bible. So here Paul is arguing the importance of the doctrine of resurrection and how Christ how resurrection fits into this narrative of Christ destroying death. So, so, so Jesus is destroying death step by step. First, uh, Jesus has overcome sin. In his life on this earth, he, he destroyed sin and he was totally sinless. And so he, Piece by piece, Jesus is taking apart death and and just destroying it, and ultimately he will completely destroy death, and uh, death will die. It's the uh, the final enemy to be destroyed. So let's read First Corinthians chapter fifteen, verse twenty-two, twenty-two to uh, twenty-six. <coughs> For as in Adam all die, 
so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order. So Paul's saying there's an order to the events. Um, it's a step, step-by-step step process. Christ, the first fruits. Uh, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. So those are the ones who were asleep in Christ, that group um, who have died and are asleep. Uh, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he delivers the kingdom to God, the Father, after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. So that's really quite interesting that, that there's all these enemies that Christ is subjecting to himself and, and the very last one is death. And so, so we can put this, this gives us a structure where we can put events in a line and, and uh, understand uh, uh, how these things line up. So how is death destroyed? It's quite uh, a diff- difficult concept for us to understand. We, uh, you know, we, death is a part of our everyday life. Well, we're given the answer in, at the end of the chapter in verse 55, verse 55 to 56. So now you can read through that in your own time, but uh, we'll just uh, jump in it uh, just before verse 55. Then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? Uh, So this is talking about the time when, in verse 54, it says, the perishable puts on imperishableness. Uh, I think that's how you say it. Uh, And the mortal puts on immortality. So this is at a resurrection of the dead. So the dead are raised and made immortal, and death is a thing of the past. Okay, so let's turn to Revelation 20, the passage we've all been waiting for. Now, we don't want to deal with the whole chapter. We just want to uh, keep in mind this idea of death being the the last enemy to be destroyed. And... um, so this is the timeline of events from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It gives us a definite order. And you can look through that in your own time. Uh, kind of running out of time here, but... So Jesus was raised. And uh, second, Jesus returns to the earth. And at that time, those who belong to Christ are resurrected. resurrected. And, and so there's this idea of Christ progressively having dominion over his enemies. And, and as we've seen, Jesus is, has already started this process of dominion and it'll be completed uh, when death is swallowed up in victory. So, so Revelation chapter 20. We can see what we want to do is put Uh, a few verses of Revelation into this timeline. And so we're only going to look at verses 4, Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. Uh, So obviously Revelation can be a bit confusing, so that's why we're just picking those verses. And um, I've already given you a hint there with uh, how these things fit into the timeline with uh, number five, six and seven. So so let's uh, read it. Revelation 20 verse four. 
Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those who those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. So that's a long way to say that that is the group of people who have died and are asleep in Christ. Um, so they came to life. So that group came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Sorry, that's the passage there. So that group came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead do not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. So what I suggest doing is putting a bracket, uh, as I've shown there, about around the first half of verse 5. And that will help you a lot, I hope, to understand this section. So there's a thousand years, and a lot of things happen at the start of the thousand years, a lot of things happen at the end of the thousand years. And so we have to put them at either end of the thousand years. So... Um, <laughs> okay... So that, that, let me just say, put to you, that there's two resurrections, okay? There's the first resurrection and the second resurrection. And with each resurrection, there's a death. So there's a first resurrection, first death, second resurrection, second death. And in between, there's the thousand years. Uh, and so, obviously... The people who are asleep in Christ now, who are dead, will be raised at the first resurrection. And as it says in verse 6, uh, they'll be made immortal and won't be affected by the second death because they'll be immortal. And during the thousand years, there'll be uh, a mortal population who... Uh, will die and they'll be raised at the second resurrection. And so this is how that passage fits in to our timeline from 1 Corinthians 15. And this, and the section we took from 1 Corinthians 15, the main point was that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Now, do you think that happens the first resurrection or the second resurrection? Obviously, it's the last enemy, so it happens at the second end of the second resurrection. And so that's how we can fit this passage of Revelation into the timeline of 1 Corinthians 15. Now, that's a little bit uh, tricky, and uh, you might need to read those uh, verses later in your own time um, uh, to, to get a better idea of what that's talking about. So the point is that that's in verse 14, at the end of the thousand years, after the second resurrection, after the second death, uh, this is where the concept of the lake of fire comes into, into being. And I'll put to you, um, we've run out of time tonight, but I'll put to you that this lake of fire is the last enemy being destroyed, which is death. It's a metaphor saying that, that death will be completely abolished. And as it says in Revelation 21, uh, verse 4, after the second death, uh, he, which is God, 
will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And this is when Christ has the final victory and everything uh, is as it should be. Now, it's quite difficult to, to comprehend how um, life will be without death. Uh, and it's something to really look forward to and to, uh, to work towards. Um, so, so how can we be part of this first, first resurrection? It all depends on what we choose to do today. We can choose life or we can choose death. Um, and it's, it's all up to our choices. Now, I thought this was uh, quite an interesting uh, analogy of changing from a grub into, into a, um, something beautiful. So, and that, that is what we're going through today. We're going through a transformation process uh, which God is working with us to transform us into something amazing. And, you know, we're not, we're not quite there yet, so, so there's um, a process. And so just as Ecclesiastes said, where we read, um, we've got to use the opportunities this life gives us to draw closer to God because we are all heading for the grave and there's no opportunities in the grave. We must look to the root cause of death, which is sin. Uh, and that's where we find the solution to this problem of death. And it's Christ. Christ is a solution. He overcame sin and therefore he overcame death. And we can choose to follow him. So if we join with, with Jesus in baptism, we can turn our backs on the old way of life, which only led to death. And we can take on a new way of life, uh, which does lead to life. And we can be sure of, of this resurrection, just as Christ was raised from the dead. And then when we die, our, our family and friends will not sorrow as other people do. There will be no need. We and they can have the confidence of awaiting a sure resurrection at the turn of, return of Christ, the first resurrection. And I hope and pray that we all can be there and be there at the second resurrection to celebrate when at last Christ has the final victory over sin and over death. Thanks, Peter. And uh, I think, think tonight we've uh, we started in John 11. We saw the death of Lazarus. We saw his resurrection. I think that for us it can be a journey. We, when we're young, life is an eternal thing. It stretches before us. We live forever. It seems in our minds. As we grow up. We start to feel cheated. The life may not be something that lasts forever. Tragedies happen in our lives. We start to feel cheated. This is where we might look to Jesus, where we look to what happened in, to Lazarus in John chapter 11, and we think there's a solution to that. He came to life again. But it wasn't really a solution, as we've learnt tonight, that. We can come for the resurrection of Lazarus. We find Jesus, but we find something much bigger than the resurrection that Lazarus had to a mortal life. We find that we can become part with Jesus in something that's much bigger than the life that we started with. And that life that we can have now, we can have a life now that's life of death or a life in life in Christ. And with that, God gives us that opportunity. He's much bigger than death. He can give us that opportunity that 
when he comes with the kingdom, that we can be part of that glory that glorifies God. So really it's, it's something that we can come and it's, a, it's something that we really want to look forward to, the, the idea of a resurrection. But the important thing to us, as I think we've learnt tonight, is that it's something much bigger than just having life. It's a much better life than what we might otherwise think that we have when we first started. So I think that's a, a, a topic that is worth thinking about and we can praise God the, for what he has, has given us as an opportunity. Now, next week, uh, God willing, we have another talk here uh, on the 18th of April, uh, Peter Pullman, speaking about how the Bible came to us. So that, of course, is a, a useful, be a useful talk to us to help us understand how we can trust in what the Bible tells us. Now, we have a light supper here afterwards, so please stay and talk and speak to Peter or myself about anything we've, uh, we've heard tonight. So we're just going to close this formal part of the meeting now, uh, again, with a word of prayer. Great Heavenly Father, we praise you as the great God, the God of life, the God of that's created this world, and we praise you that you have offered us so much. We thank you that you've given us your word, the Bible, that we might know of you, we might know who you are, and we might know the great hope that you have offered to this world. When we look in the world around us, we see a world that is scarred by sin. It's, it's a good world, God. It's, there's much beauty in it, but we can see the faults. We can see the, we can see the illness. We can see the death. We can see all of the faults that are in this world. And God, we look forward to that time when your glory will shine as it ought to be, when this world becomes the world that you want it to be, the world that it ought to have been at creation, when it was very good. A world without sin, God, and we look forward to when you will reveal this world to us at the return of your son. Please, God, let us be part of that. Help us that, to be part of that glory that we might be able to glorify you at that time. In the meantime, God, we thank you for the blessings that we have around us. And we thank you for the food that we have now. We thank you for this time that we've been able to have together to, to read of your word. And please, God, be with us in the week to come and be a strength to us that we might know and understand and serve you. It's in the name of your son, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you.